Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, workshop on the statistics platform. I'm sure most of you know Andy Robinshaw, our senior flight data analyst, who's going to uh, present to you today. Uh, I'll just reiterate, I'm sure you know, uh, please use the Q&A text function to answer questions and uh, they come through to us. And then we can, uh, if, if one's relevant, we'll answer it as we go along. Otherwise, we'll save them until the end and we'll run through them at the end. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Andy uh, for the rest of the presentation. Andy. All right. Um, thank you, Rob. Um, I will share my screen now. And then here's our presentation. All right. So um, today we'll be starting with um, a brief presentation on the statistics platform attached to Flight Data Connect and um, some background to the statistics that are available as well, with a particular focus on avoiding deception in statistics. Now, I will mention avoiding deception a lot because especially if we're, if we're all watching the news, um, you'll see a lot of statistics bandied around. They might be valid, but if they're presented in a certain way, you can um, make your statistics misleading very quickly. Um, and especially on sort of live broadcasts, because you're not giving people a long period of time to look at the statistics and taking the information, um, it can be all too easy to come up with a wrong conclusion. Okay, so today, as I mentioned, we'll be doing a statistics refresher, a little bit about data visualization and creating um, sort of a good chart that effectively gets your message across and avoiding deception, and then how this all relates to your statistics in Flight Data Connect. So, to start with, we'll be looking at things like event counts, event rates, um, the normalization of your data. So if you're a big operator flying hundreds of thousands of flights a year, how do you compare yourself to a smaller operator, maybe only flying 10,000 or 5,000 flights per year? You can't just be using your counts there. Differences, different averages, um, and then samples versus populations. A little bit about box plots because they will come into, into play later when we're looking at trending as well as little reminder about correlation and causation. So, as I mentioned, um, if you're a large operator, your number of total events, total occurrences, um, is not a direct comparison to a smaller operator. If you're, you know, British Airways, you're flying many, many thousands of flights, so you will have many, many more landings. So your count of landings is not a direct comparison to someone who's a smaller regional operator, for example. So that's why First of all, we will, we'll be, yeah, we will be talking about event rates rather than event counts. So in terms of Flight Data Connect, your event rate is very simply, how many of that event would you have per thousand flights? So if you only have 100 flights, you can think of it as, well, we multiply your count by 10 to get your event rate. And if you have 100,000 flights, then we divide your count by 100. And it's that simple. But we do that to normalize the data and uh, be able to compare broadly against other operators. I will go into why you shouldn't compare your own events to other operators in certain circumstances in a bit. Um, but yes, so broadly it's to enable comparison um, and to enable you to say one month compared to the next month has been different in terms of, um, in terms of your counts. Now, things like cabin crew, lost time injuries, you can normalize that in different ways. Um, as well as in terms of the maintenance incidents or maintenance errors or ground damage, you can normalize that in a different way. Now, normalizing your data is fine to do. There's nothing wrong with it. As a practice, it's perfectly fine. Um, you have to make sure that you're consistent though and your choices of normalization are valid. If you were normalizing your data event rate to every one flight, you're going to end up with lots and lots of decimals going on. Now that's not necessarily a problem but you just have to be as honest um, and sort of as genuine as you can with, prevent, with presenting your statistics. So little count versus rate. If we're looking at operator A, they've had 50 hard landings and operator B has only had 10. Initially, operator A is seeming worse. That's just from the count. So operator A in this case would be our large airline who has many, many thousands of flights and operator B might be a smaller one. So you see, we're looking at now a rate of 50 versus a rate of 100. So out of every 1,000 flights that operator B has, they're gonna hit the ground quite hard um, on at least 100 of them based on their previous data. And operator A will do it at 50. Now, 
I did just make a little um, mistake there. I've just used a probability. This is not a probability. Um, this is, the probabilities change constantly. This is just a way of expressing your previously flown data. To make predictions, it can be done, but there are obviously errors um, introduced in predictions. And because flight data and a flight has so many different parameters going on, even the slightest gust of wind at takeoff can have a very significant impact later on in the flight, particularly if it shakes up one, it shakes up the pilot a little bit and their different behavior can affect everything else further down the line. So making a prediction, for example, are we going to have a hard landing soon? It's very hard to do, but it can be generalized. So you might be able to say in our fleet, we are likely to have a hard landing in the next month based on the way our data is going but you wouldn't be able to pick any individual flight and say it's going to happen on that flight. So one of the questions we get asked quite often is what's, what's our average or, or what's the industry average for event rates? What's an acceptable um, or as low as reasonably practical rate for a certain events? Now asking what an average is, is a challenge in itself. So long as you specify the average and you're consistent about it when you're making historical comparisons, you can do this, um, but the average alone does not describe the spread of the data. So here's a little example that I've just drawn up. So in this, I, in this scenario, I've gone for a job and they've advertised that the average salary is about 50,000, but they've said they'll pay me the average, but now, now they only pay me 25,000. So did they lie? Yes and no. They didn't necessarily lie if the spread of salaries looks like this. So if you have six normal employees, each making 25,000, but you have one CEO on 200,000, that average, so the arithmetic mean, becomes 50,000, which makes it seem quite, because it, in, in terms of this, let's assume 50,000 is quite nice in whatever currency this is. Now, that's double what actually most people are gonna get paid. No one in the company is being paid that mean. So even if we ask, what is our mean average for um, airspeed at touchdown. No, you don't necessarily have to have anyone touching down at that mean in the same way that the mean average number of eyes for a human to have is slightly less than two. So you either have the eyes or you don't. Like That's the thing. So in terms of the average, it might not be the perfect way to display your data. In this case, the more honest, more genuine way to explain, to describe this data would have been to use the median. So as we've ordered all of the salaries up, the one in the middle would be the median. So that gives you a better idea of how the pay at this company would be spread. Now, when we're looking at flight data, um, particularly in Flight Data Connect, we'll be looking at the medians and where the quartile ranges are as well. Particularly for trending data, this is what we'll be doing, but we'll be displaying it in a box plot. So that's why we're looking at median rather than a mean. And that's how we end up with this. So in Flight Data Connect, for the trending, what we'll see at the end um, of, the, of today is we'll see uh, multiple key point values, so multiple measurements um, explained or described per month or per year by the, um, the box plot layout of that data. So mostly what we'll be looking at is where is that median? Where, um, where are the quartiles? So the, first, the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile, where are they sort of laying? And what is that interquartile range? So the interquartile range is important in your flight data because that shows basically how consistent is your operation. If you have a very wide interquartile range, you have a bunch of pilots who are not flying in the same way. If you have everyone bang on top of each other, that's pretty much ideal, so long as they're on top of each other in the exact place that you want them to be. Now that can never really be achieved. That's why we see um, distributions. Often it's a normal distribution, but slightly skewed so sometimes in certain directions. But yes, so that's why we'll be seeing a distribution because humans make mistakes. And as I said before, that, that slight mistake way up the approach can lead to a different landing than if, um, if there was a slightly different input further back. So last reminder, um, before we do data visualization, correlation does not equal causation. You'll hear this often and again and again and again. And if you ever go to a statistics presentation, this will be one of the first things that they'll say. Um, I could find things that correlate till the cows come home. We can make things look like, if we present them in a certain way, we can make it look like 
US crude import crude, US crude oil imports from Norway cause drivers to be killed in collisions with railway trains. Now, in this case, they're not linked. We can look at the data subjectively say, and say, even though the correlation is quite strong, we see at the bottom there it's 95%, even though it's a strong correlation, these two things are not inherently linked. So that's why, that's one of the key um, inputs that you, you guys will have um, when you're looking at your flight data statistics, because you can make it look that, you know, a certain, um, a certain procedure to do with cabin crew and tidying up the galley has a certain impact on landings because you can you can correlate things and if they do correlate it's very easy to say ah yes this procedure or this new um, briefing that we've been doing has this impact now where you come in and where the value you you add is is that you can add subjectivity to that you can say yes this is this um, trend is happening since we've introduced this but that new procedure doesn't actually impact this, or you can start to explain why it does impact that. And it's those sorts of differences that the most valuable thing you can add here. Which brings us on to data visualization. So we can just present a graph if we wanted to, or we could just present some box plots, but really what we're trying to do is present new information to people and we're trying to inform them about um, a particular scenario. So it could be about how hard the aircraft is landing, whereabouts in the runway you're touching down, um, pilot technique, so long as you're proving, so long as you can justify what you're trying to show. Or you might even think of it simply as your emojis. Now, all you're doing is showing information. So I'm happy, or I'm finding this hilarious, or it's my someone celebrating something. You can get that information very quickly from these little images. So nothing too complex, you don't need an explanation. You send one of those emojis, people know what you mean. Now, all this is, is a way of showing the data. It's not as official or presentable um, you know, to management as a line graph or a bar graph or anything like that, but it is a way of presenting your data. So, so is your satnav. Your satnav has, has had to find, the companies who make these have had to find a way to present lots of information to you very quickly and make it very decipherable while you're not truly able to focus on the screen because you're driving. So they need to know, they need to have figured out where to display that speed limit banner across the top, how to show you which direction to take at the next junction in the top left there. And to do this, they're, they're looking at symbols, they're looking at placement, they're looking at color patterns. They're basically looking at what a person can interpret from this information and what information they need to give. And that's pretty much how you need to think about your charts, just presenting a graph of here are our top 10 events last year. Right, well done. Anyone can do that though. You've got to be adding value and you've got to be presenting data in a way that's interpretable by your audience. So if you're presenting to technical staff or engineering staff, you might be able to go into far more numeric detail than you will if you're presenting to a board of directors about general safety in the airline. And we'll also see heat maps when we're watching football matches. Now you can do these as well, um, but similar in Flight Data Connect, particularly with your touchdown points or your liftoff points. So if you're looking at, you know, where have we touched down on the runway, you could again present that in a line graph or a bar graph, or you could present it in a visual form. So if you're trying to il illustrate a particular problem to crews or captains, um, if you're showing it in a visual form, showing them where, where they're actually lifting off, that can be more hard hitting than just a line graph and saying, you know, anything less than 200 is very bad. If you're showing them and saying, actually, you had very little runway left at the end, um, that can hit, hit home more. Cricket again does the same thing. We're looking at lots of data here. So really, we want to be showing how the ball was thrown, uh, bowled, how many runs they got and whereabouts it bounced relative to the bowler and what well, relative to the batter. So we're looking at ways of displaying data that's quickly understandable because this needs to flash up as a highlight or a little infographic between the different bowls. Golf does the same thing. From that information there, we can interpret um, the arc that each, per each player's ball took, the ground roll that each player's ball took, um, general height, general length, and where the balls have ended up. So that, that type of information is very well displayed in the 3D graphical view. Now, a lot of your flight data, you won't be looking at in this way. Um, particularly if you're looking at trends. But in one of the examples we're going to do later, um, we will be looking at a 3D track 
relating to um, the approach into a certain airport. And there's just another cricket example, giving us extra information. But in this case, rather than giving us raw information, we've got the information about whether the ball was going to hit the wicket, whether it's going to hit the bales, that type of thing. So in that case, the information has been boiled down into a yes or no for certain parts. So was a certain rate going to be higher than another one? That type of thing. You can do this as well. So think about it as more than just a clear chart. In this case, we're looking at flight data events, with no scale, which is a rookie mistake. And also there isn't too much information about what we're considering as a flight data event. So when you're presenting a graph, try and consider, um, try and consider the questions that you're going to get asked about this graph. Try and red team yourself. So yeah, try and pick holes in your own presentation and in your own arguments. And if you're presenting something important, try and get other people who know about the subject to try and poke holes, to just tear apart your argument and your um, point of view. And then you'll be able to identify any weaknesses and try and help yourself out. So when you're presenting a chart, such as this one, computing power is increasing year by year. We know that. Um, we can see that all around us, but we want to present that in a data form. So in this case, I've plotted transistor count against the year. Well, I haven't plotted it, I've got the graph, but yeah, we've got transistor count versus the year. Now, when I say, what is your big idea? Try and put that at the top. Try and have that as your title. We can also have you know, a graph to show transistor count versus the year, um, but try and give an explanation. So explain to me what you want, what you're trying to show with this data and then provide me with the data. And then often underneath you'll see, yeah, that's where the explanation will come in. So maybe we see uh, an anomaly and we might be thinking, well, you know, this was designed for a different, um, a different purpose. So that's why it's here. So yes, we can highlight anomalies as well in our charts. What you'll see here, what's interesting here, is that my scale up the side is non-linear. Now, you don't need to have a linear scale. You can do exponential, like we have here. So every major line um, is actually a 10 times increase in transistor count on the previous major line. Now that's fine, so long as what we're trying to show uh, fits into that. So in this case, when we're looking at a straight up diagonal line based on an exponential scale, if we put that as a linear scale, we would see a lot of flat at, towards the bottom. We'd see until about the mid 90s here, we'd see a lot of, actually until about early 2000s, we'd see a lot of flat point, a lot of points across the bottom. And then it would shoot up towards the right hand side of the graph. Now, that's not really what we want to present here. We want to show um, the continuous development. We don't want to make it look like in the mid 2000s, everything just shot up. So that's why um, picking a scale can also be important. And this brings us, brings us on to avoiding deception. Do we have any questions about the previous stuff? Um, we've got why use a thousand sectors in calculating the event rate. Um, this is just an industry standard. It could have been per 100 or per 50. It's just per 1,000 um, It's quite a nice round number so that when we're looking at, when we're talking about, you know, 90.2% of my flights have at least one level one event on them, you're actually not talking about a decimal, you're talking about, you know, 902 out of my 1,000 um, have that. It's just 1,000 was a nice round number. Um, it's easily divisible and easily multipliable. So that was chosen for those purposes. All right. So um, avoiding deception whether deliberate or accidental. So um, I think I'm gonna release a poll right now. Heather, gonna release a poll right now. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so we should have a poll appearing on your screens soon. Is it up?
Okay, so we've got 20 of you have seen um, a misleading chart used and seven haven't. So I could start saying you know, most people have seen a misleading chart used, but again, that would be me using a misleading chart. What we have here is a sample, a limited sample size, um, because the people here today do not represent the whole of aviation, um, because obviously there are more than about 40 people involved in the aviation world. So to, for me to make a conclusion, to draw a conclusion from this survey, um, would itself be misleading. Now, there are different types of misleading. I will be talking about um, sample versus population in a bit. But um, one of the first ones that we'll be talking about um, is the chart type and how you display this information. So the problem here is not the question that I've asked. If I've asked you know, 100 people, which color do you like? And giving them a bunch of options, nothing wrong with that. But if I wanted to display that as a pie chart, what I would have had to ask is, what is which of these is your favorite color? Or um, which color do you least like? Something like that, where people can only give one answer. Whereas in this case, what I've asked is, which color do you like? So you might like all four colors, or you might only you might not like any. So displaying this as a percentage is in itself false. Also because in a pie chart, as we all know, percentages have to add up to 100%. So if I was I've, yeah, so we've got 55, 40, 32, doesn't add up. And also um, the way I've displayed the colors um, as the words is disingenuous. So I'm making it look like if you just glance at this chart briefly, you're looking at it and thinking, um, well, yeah, yellow is in the lead, but it's not because yellow is only 25%. So with this example, I've been deliberately misleading, but you might see pie charts used, um, particularly sort of in political surveys on the news. You might see pie charts used um, in ways that they shouldn't be. So um, popular examples are, you know, would you back this candidate and then showing it as a pie chart? In those cases, that should be a bar graph because, because I could answer two or three different answers because I might support multiple candidates. Um, yeah, basically, if you want to do a pie chart, total has to add up to 100% and each thing or each person can only have had one answer. You might also see access manipulation. So if I was to present these two graphs um, in, a, in a meeting and not really put them up on the screen for too long um, so that people don't truly get to take in the information that I'm showing them, they might think that actually the unstable approach rates will probably be the same across our A320s and 777s. What you see is the, the y-axis has been manipulated in this case. So I've deliberately um, made the 777s look worse than they were. They were always about half of what the A320s were for this rate. So I could have displayed both of these on the same chart. Um, so long as I labeled my lines to say, this is the A320s compared to the 777s and that type of thing. We'll also get the point of, um, in this case, I can do this. I can link them, link the points as a line because it's a continuous, so the x-axis is a continuous scale. If I was going back to my previous question um, about which color do you like, I could not link those across um, each x-axis point because green does not merge into red. So you can't be, you can't, in the questionnaire that I've asked, you can't like 90% green and 4% blue, that type of thing. Um, yeah, basically, if, you're, if your categories are discrete, you can't use a line graph um, and you can't link them across the top of them. So this is when we get onto sample size versus population. So we've all seen um, surveys such, a bit, such as this, or you might see it pop up at the bottom of a, an advert, say, oh, 90% of women love this product. But in this case, in my imaginary survey, I've only surveyed 10. So I can't claim that 90% of women love the product because the standard error on that survey is going to be very high. So if you think of, think of the standard error as if I increase my population, the standard error, so the like the distance that I'm going to be away from the true mean um, decreases. Basically, more people gives you a better representation of the population. In the same way that if we look at 100 people and we sum summarize that Britain is getting fatter, or you'll see political surveys like this. So Americans want more cycle paths. Well, the little bit I've put in at the bottom there, Erion County, Texas, is very small in terms of population compared to the whole of America. So again, to say that Americans want more cycle paths just off what the voters of one county say um, is not representative of population. So 
how this relates to your flight data is don't think that your events um, might your events might not truly represent what the overall um, aviation industry is seeing. So this is where things like flight data exchange come in because their their pool of data is representing around 10 percent um, of global air traffic, whereas yours might only represent 0.01 or something percent of aviation traffic. Comparing yourself using the flight data exchange tool um, gives you a much better representation of what the population is. Another thing you've got to be wary of, because you can change these types of options in the Flight Data Connect uh, statistics platform, is gerrymandering. So in political terms, it's a way of moving the boundaries so that you don't have to change where the voters are. If you just change the boundaries, you pick what counts and what doesn't count. In the graph on the right here, if my summary was landings into Africa are the most dangerous, there's a couple of things wrong with this statement. If you look at the continents and the areas across the bottom, I've deliberately excluded Europe from this graph. So if, we've, if most of our flights are within Europe, I can't just look at this and say, oh yeah, Africa is the most dangerous because we've got Europe involved, as, we need to have Europe involved as well. We're also looking at an event count. So I might have 12 in events coming into central, going into Central America, but if I've only flown into Central America twice, whereas I fly into Africa 10 times a day, 10 years, the rate going into Central America is going to be a lot higher than it is for Africa. So when we talk about normalizing the data, that's one of the things um, that we'll be looking at. When you have different amounts of flights into different airports, it's not just for comparing um, across different operators. If you, yeah, it's for making sure that your comparison to say, oh, uh, you guys being honest with your statistics, you can make your data say almost anything you want it to, so long as you manipulate and cherry pick certain things. Don't do that. You won't be helping anyone and you won't be helping your own safety either. Because if you're presenting statistics and saying this is not a problem and this is a problem, but actually that's not true, then you can be harming your own operation. Even though you might be you know, avoiding fines or avoiding um, auditors looking into something, if you present those statistics in your own safety meetings and to your own crews, they might think, oh, we're doing perfectly well um, with our landings, but actually they, they might be far worse than other operators of the same type. And again, it is, it's all about responsibility. Um, that falls into the honesty as well. But when we're looking at the charts, when we want to talk about what our data is showing, emphasize it. So if you find something that is truly a link and you have all the data to prove it, show it. Um, prove it, emphasize it, but above all, um, be honest with it. Right. So I did say, um, where does this link in? Well, we're looking at the Flight Data Connect platform. So this is L3 Harris's um, Flight Data Monitoring platform. So some of you, I think most of you actually are customers at the moment, um, but those of you who aren't, Flight Data Connect is, our, is the overall um, Flight Data Monitoring platform. It takes you through uh, all of your standard event monitoring, um, all of your algorithms um, are all built in. Change your own thresholds, which it brings up another problem with um, comparing yourself to other operators. And it's got the built-in statistics platform. So that statistics platform gives you unprecedented fle flexibility compared to the previous versions. You've got so many options now, so we might decide that actually we are only interested in, in the flights into Europe. But if I, look, if I only look at flights into Europe, then I can't make any conclusions about our flights into Africa, um, just because I'm not looking at anything that represents that population. Think of each, con in this case, think of landing into each continent or each region as a different population. If I'm only sampling, you know, the heights of people in Scotland, I can't come to any summary about how tall Italians are. It just can't be done because it's not representative. There are also restrictions on what you can do in the Flight Data Connect statistics platform, but um, this point mainly applies to the restrictions that you will pick on your statistics. So you might say, actually, only show me events that have happened during final approaches. And again, judging from that, you can't then say our biggest problem in terms of safety is high speed on the approach. Because if you're not looking at other parts of the flight, you're not giving yourself a genuine picture. 
key point values are very important and events are very important as well. These are the two main types of statistics that we'll be um, dealing with in Flight Data Connect. And um, because some systems, some FDM systems don't run in the same way, I'll do a little bit of a, only like two slides, three slides on how this all works. And then we'll launch into a live demonstration of the actual Flight Data Connect statistics platform. So when data comes in um, to Flight Data Connect, what it will do is it will process the data, obviously decode from the 10001 binary patterns um, into usable flight data. So in this case, I've just put the radio altitude and the altitude AAL onto a graph. I've also put our key time instances. So this is where the system has looked into the data and said, yes, based on these parameters and this algorithm, that is the touchdown point. So a key time instance is just that, it's a point. And from there, we can work backwards. So we say our final approach started when they got onto runway heading and all of that type of thing, all of the different criteria. So we can put another key time instance there. Now between key time instances, we can put what we call a phase. So in this case, we've got the orange, the approach down at the bottom there. So yeah, the approach starts at whatever height this approach started at. But once we're within that phase, we can then take a key point value. So we might say, you know, what was my airspeed at the top of the approach or how, what flap setting did I have on landing? And that would be a key point value. So these measurements are taken on every single flight, regardless of whether there's an event associated with them or not. Just to give you a bit of perspective, on a, trip, on a 787, you can expect about 700 of these measurements per flight, depending on what's happened on the flight. So things like, you know, ground speed, touchdown, flap, touchdown, that will, measure will always be taken. And that comes in handy when we're looking at key point value statistics. So if I've got hundreds of thousands of flights, I can now start to plot the ground speed at touchdown on every single flight onto a histogram or into a box plot. And this is how we can do our trending. You should never really trend off of your events. Your events give you something to, they point at something that might be interesting. And then for your trending purposes, that's when you go and you look at your key point values. So we'll do a bit of that in a minute as well. But all an, all an event is, is a limit or a threshold that you set on one of these KPVs. So if I wanted to, do, I could say, actually, I don't want my aircraft to touch down in weather that's hotter than 25 degrees. Um, that'd be fine. It would be strange as a limit, but you could do it because that measurement is taken here. So you could set a limit or a threshold on that. But all that looks like is this. So here we've got the green limit. So level one, or it might be called a green or an A in certain um, systems, orange or level two and red would be the level three in this case. Now, you, in Flight Data Connect, so the L3 Harris system, you can customize all of these thresholds. Andy, you also, just, uh, just for about 30 seconds there, we just lost you, you froze, so we didn't hear that. Okay, um, what was the last bit that you heard? Uh, I can't remember exactly where you were, to be perfectly honest with you, we lost about 20, 30 seconds. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I'll just go back a bit. So this is where you would um, pick which events you want to monitor and which thresholds you want to monitor those events to. So you might say the maximum airspeed I want my pilots to be at during final approach is 150 knots. So you would set that limit in here. Now, if you were looking at your event rate, so your, if the number of times that triggers per thousand flights, that's, that's fine. So long as you keep that event and that threshold set for a very long period of time, you can then start to compare month by month. But now if you as an operator come to compare that event rate with my event rate for that same thing, that's where the comparison is completely invalid because I can have picked, I might have picked 140 knots. So now we're not comparing like for like anymore. That's why um, the IATA flight data exchange program comes in because they use the same thresholds for the same type of aircraft. So all 777s will use the same threshold. So when you're comparing your event rate to other operators, you might see, ah, we're triggering more of the high speed on approach events than other operators. You know that other operators are all using the same threshold as well for this. So that's, that's a way of spotting um, some trends. And really the only way to compare your own event rates to other operators is through the flight data exchange program. Now you could compare your key point values to everyone, 
and that would be a, that's a valid way to do a direct comparison. Um, but yeah, really, the, if, if you want to compare events, that's uh, the IATA Flight Data Exchange program. So this is where we jump into it. The Flight Data Connect um, statistics platform. So there are different reports available. There's the events report, the key point value report. They're the two we're going to be most interested in here. We've got the aircraft report, fuel burn, crew report, flight report. Now, all of those are available. Um, I think the fuel burn is an extra, it's a paid add-on. But the crew reports, so long as you send us crew information um, about who, which crew members were flying certain flights, if you delve into the crew report, you can start to look at, ah, certain crew members are triggering you know, more of the unstable approach related events than others are. Some are flying their approaches quicker than others relative to the target speed. Some are coming in steeper or with a greater rate of descent. That type of thing um, can all be done in the crew report. And then if you start to look at the key point values and that crew member's spread of key point values, you can see actually this pilot is, um, is trending upwards, for example. So they're getting, are they taking more risk or are they just getting a bit more confident? Who, who knows? Um, but that's when you adding the subjective uh, value to the, the data presentation um, comes in handy. So I've got one, two, okay. Right, so if there are, are there any questions about that presentation before we go into um, the live demonstration? Good, thank okay. you. Um, let me just bring up the statistics platform. Okay, so I've logged in as my ZZZ analyst, so Sunny Sky Charter um, operates our fake operator. So here we'll see our reports. Um, you see that the Sunny Sky Charter operator um, doesn't send in crew information because it's a fake airline. So um, that's a bit isn't available here, but. The two main reports that we're going to be interested in are, are our events report and our key point values report here. So I'm just going to open one of each. Now, all of the, the example data that I'm going to be using um, is from 2018. So this is a question of restricting what I want to see. Everything you see in the blue bar up the top here will restrict what I'm about to see. So I might say, actually, only show me my business jet data. So all I have to do is click on the fleets that I want to see and click apply. Now there won't be any data because it's all from 2018. Now, if I say, actually only show me data from 2018 and click apply, this is when we'll start to see our top 10 um, events popping up here. And you see that our metric is event rate because we might have flown different numbers of flights with our Falcons than we have with our Gulfstreams and our globals might only fly twice a year or twice a month um, because it's an this bit, this example is an executive operation. So it could, um, yeah, so there's no way of guaranteeing how many flights uh, each individual aircraft is going to do. So, um, ah, yes, so there's a question. Um, yes, so the FD, the Flight Data Connect statistics platform will um, only show event rate by per 1,000, um, per 1,000 flights. And that's, uh, that's just how it is. But if you wanted to see in different ways, if you wanted to think of it as per 100, then um, just divide by 10. That's why, we, that's why the per 1,000 is a standard sort of industry rate because it's quite nice and easy to use. Now, in this case, I'm showing all of my level ones, twos and threes up on here. But if I wanted to, I can restrict myself even further. I might say, don't show me the level ones. And then I just click apply and we'll see a new bar graph will render below. What I could do is go for something a bit dishonest and show a line graph. Now, I mentioned the um, be careful about dishonesty because this now is quite dishonest. So what, what, I'm sure, what I make it look like is that there is some kind of trend down towards the right hand side here, but there isn't because a rate of climb high 1000 feet before level flight has no link whatsoever to whether you landed a bit slow relative to your target speed. So this is the type of thing where we come up with a chart type selection error. Whereas really what, what we have to look at here is we can look at column graphs and 
column graphs or bar graphs would be the best way to display this type of information because I'm looking at um, which individual, so which discrete event, because no event can be halfway between these two, no occurrence can fit you know, halfway through here. I can't link those up. I could display this by event count if I wanted to. So the important thing to remember is again, everything up the top restricts the data. Everything we do down here is just a different way of displaying that data that we've restricted ourselves to. We could, um, further down, if we use this drop down, we could restrict ourselves to, you know, only show me data from an aircraft flight operating a certain engine type, or only show me a certain event. And we'll go into that in a minute. And that's why, um, yeah, that'll be in a minute. Right. So now I've just, all I'm going to do is restrict myself to my level threes. And when we're down on this sort of chart, we can zoom in if we want to, um, or we can zoom in on certain areas. So again, the way I could be, you know, dishonest with my data is to click and drag and zoom in. Now suddenly I'm presenting the top nine, but if I change that to, you know, 20 and did it like this, and then presented that in a meeting of our top 20 events, not many people are going to count the number of columns that I've got, particularly if I flash it up on the screen and I'll do it quite quickly. So this is where um, the honesty comes into it because it's quite easy to make charts that are misleading, but don't. So the flexibility here is very useful when we're actually doing proper analysis, but if you're not careful, um, it could also be used um, for nefarious purposes. So in this case, we'll see that we've got our unstable approaches as our second highest. So we'll remember that in a minute. And um, we've got different options up here as well. So because I've restricted myself to certain sets of data, I might come down here and say, you know, actually show me where these events happened. So I will be clicking through semi quickly with these options. Um, but yeah, so I'm actually going to want to see an event count. Um, show me, show me all, of, all of my events, all of my level threes by the country that they happened in. So it's just, a lot of this is just um, learning which, which options suit what you want them to do. So just have a play around, have a look at different things. You can't break this. Um, so yeah, go in and have a look at all the reports you're interested in you might find that there is nothing interesting. So I could have looked at this and found, oh, actually, we've just got you know, a couple of events in every country that we go to. But you see here, most of our events are in Germany. Well, the greatest number in 95. We've got 45 in the Netherlands, 24 in France, a couple in Greece, Turkey, Hungary. But yes, yeah, so if I wanted to split, split out by this, I could. And again, if I wanted to be dishonest, I could say, only show me Africa. And now we're going to look and think, oh, we've got no events. Now that's because I've picked a part of the world that's not representative um, of my total event population. But so this is where we'll go back to um, our generic bar chart. And we're going to start to dig into our unstable approaches here. So if I want to restrict to a certain event, I can do that. I just click on the more option. And instead of restricting by you know an engine type or a particular aircraft, I can just come in here and say, actually, only show me um, unstable approaches. Now, because I've only restrict, I've restricted to one individual event, we're going to see one column because the axis is the event name. But if I decide actually, go on, show me by landing airports. So we start to see this type of thing now. Now we're seeing 1000s here. So this means that we may have flown there once and we've had one level three unstable approach which doesn't give us um, a true representation. So I could say, show me by count, or I could say, actually, only show me places that you know, I've flown to more than 10 times. So now we've given ourselves a, wide, a, a bigger data pool. So these four airports that we have up here, we've flown to more than 10 times, and we see that EHAM comes out way in the top for unsafe approaches. So we might, we might want to dig further down and look at the runway. And we see EHAM 04. So this is the one that's triggering a level three approach, a uh, level three unstable approach every time we fly into there. And we've flown there more than 10 times. So the only other place we've flown more than 10 times, we don't have that many um, unstable approaches. So this is when we would go back into our, um, into our regular you know, Flight Data Connect platform and we would come up with um, a search. So we'd search for show me all unstable approaches um, landing into into Shippel, so EHAM04, I've done the search already. 
and we come up with this. So we could now start to look into each individual flight. So this is relating um, our statistics back to an investigation. Um, yeah, we can go into each individual flight and we're going to see certain events. So we see high roll, unstable approaches and heading variation. We see unstable approach, heading variation there, unstable approach and heading variation. So it's looking like um, we're doing a lot of late turn-ins um, onto these runways. So what we can do, um, if we tick everything and we click the visualization box at the bottom, we can actually download the Google Earth tracks. Has it? No. Sorry about that, I'm actually done that. I've moved my mouse onto the other screen. There we go, we'll click on that. Uh, if we just leave everything smooth. And then, yeah, so we'll be downloading um, some Google Earth tracks here, which we'll be able to look at in a minute once they've uh, finalized. So yeah, that's how we might look at um, a particular event. Now, we could say, actually, show me, again, all events. So if we wanted to do um, potentially misleading trending, that can also be done here. Um, but there are ways to do this trending, honestly, as well. Now, instead of the access being the landing runway, if I said, uh, show me by month, now what we're doing is we're looking at the, um, we're looking at the order so we're looking at the top months because i've set the order to be show me the top so it's not in chronological order and um, show me the level three event rate by month if i wanted to i could say uh, just show me all and then this will show in chronological order so <clears throat> you might have targets of event rates to hit per month see october's nice round thousand there um yeah so you might have a target to hit so if you create this type of chart so if, once you've got your thresholds an event set how you want them to be um, if you create this kind of chart and then draw on your you know acceptable line there um, that's how you can come up with your information and if you're zooming in on certain areas you might want to move the axis up but again make sure that everyone knows that you you've changed the axis rebasing the axis is always a bit of, um, a, bit of a questionable subject anyway right so uh, let's see if that downloads right now. I'm just going to get rid of that. So, yeah. Now, the other type of trending we'll be looking at um, is key point values. So, really, the only true way to do your trending is through the key point values. If you think of the events as pointing you uh, in a particular direction or giving you something that could be interesting to look at, then uh, you'll be coming here to your key point values for trending. So, I'm just going to pick. Um, I'm going to pick my Falcon fleet here just because I can. While I open up, do that. Ah, yeah. Sorry. Here's the. Here are the visualizations I've just downloaded of the uh, of the aircraft tracks on our unstable approaches. So you see, we're landing into Amsterdam Schiphol. Here, um, runway zero four. So zero four is this one here. So when we're triggering all of our late turns, our heading variations, our high rolls close to the ground, that's because we're following this approach where we come in and we're making a late turn in. Now, so long as this is all risk assessed and it's all being flown um, properly and well, then it might not be a problem. But if you haven't approved this type of approach and you're seeing this type of event triggering a lot, then you might be wanting to talk to your pilots. So um, through statistics, we've come up with what could be a potential risk, um, especially considering the low heights that this turn is made. Sometimes they're around 20 to 50 feet when they get wings level over here. We could also then start to measure this distance from the widest to the narrowest person taking this turn. So you see we've got what, about, about 200 meters ish. So this is when I was talking about the distributions as well. If that turn from our narrowest person to our widest person starts to get um, into such a big difference, that we're looking at inconsistencies, then that might be something that we have to address uh, in simulator sessions, because for something like this, for this type of approach, we need people to be flying it on point and we need them to be consistent as well. So letting a bit, letting inconsistency slide when doing this type of operation, um, adds in more risk than letting a bit of drift at 10,000 feet slip in. I'm just gonna get rid of all of that. So yeah, the final little bit we'll be doing um, is the key point values report. So I mentioned previously um, that we'll be looking at where your sort of median is, where your median value is, as opposed to where your mean, um, 
mean averages. So in this case, we're looking at the distribution. So in this, all I've picked here is the flare distance, 20 feet to touchdown um, in meters. But I could have picked any number of key point values. All of these options are available up here. I could pick, you know, what was the fuel, if I was paying for the fuel thing, I could look at the fuel burn, fuel we're burning or taxiing, or, you know, the maximum ground speed, the ground speed when we're hitting take off and go around. But this is how um, we do true benchmarking to other operators. So this little button here will let you compare yourself, so your own key point value spreads to other operators of the same type. So ideally, your blue curve will coincide with the gray curve. And in this case, there's not too much difference between the blue and the gray. So this shows that my operation is flying much the same, but broadly the same as other operators of the same type. But if I was seeing my curve to the right or to the left of this gray curve, then I'm seeing that I'm actually out of sync with what other operators are doing. Now, this gray curve is not necessarily what is advised by the manufacturer, but it is what other operators of the same type are doing. So, yeah, you will see that manufacturers, when they publish their takeoff performance, they're doing it based on, mostly based on um, their test pilots and how good they are. Now, you're never really going to achieve everyone falling into one particular column. So no, you're never going to have everyone flaring for 300 to 350 meters. Um, it's just not doable. That's where the human variation comes in. But really, you want to be looking at this, this range here. So long as you're within the general um, gray curve, you're going to be mostly OK here. And yeah, you can display this as a box plot as well. So if you wanted to have the axis as a month, this is how you would do your trending. So instead of looking at when we get, where are we getting the most level threes, or is our level one event rate going up, you're going to be missing a lot of extra information there. Um, but if you're looking at your key point values and looking at your interquartile range, so from there up to there, and where your medians are, you can see that actually in general, there's not too much of a trend here. There's a bit of an uptrend towards July, January, uh, towards May, June, and July. So maybe we're, maybe we're flying slightly differently in the summer. You've got an outlier up here. Now this is the type of thing that you would expect to be caught by, or be, to be triggering an event. So in terms of trending, you don't necessarily need to worry too much about these outliers. You're looking at where the broad body of your flights are. This, is, this type of thing would be, um, you would spot this through um, looking at your events, making sure that you know, your event rates for certain things don't go up too much. And that would give you something that you might be interested in. Now, I've only plotted, here I've only plotted flare distance, 20 feet to touchdown, but I could also, I could plot any number of KPVs. So I might be looking at, you know, gas temperature on startup for a particular engine. And if it's increasing month by month or week by week, flight by flight for a particular aircraft, that's when I might start to look and say, if it carries on on this trend, we're gonna to have to do an engine inspection in 10 flight cycles or 20 flight cycles. So that would be an extreme, but yeah, you can do this sort of um, analysis as well through your flight data monitoring program. And um, yeah, so that's that's me done, Rob. Um, have we got any questions? Great, thanks, Annie. Yeah, there's a we've got three questions here. Uh, is there a limit on the month range? Uh, for example, can I see events for my airline back in 2018? Yes. Yes, you can. So long as um, you were a customer back then, or you send in historic data for us to process, um, yes, we can. You can populate data as far back as you need to. Yeah. Uh, the next one is in the, in the event page. What does metric mean? Is it the way the bars are ordered on the x-axis? Uh, no, the metric is what we're measuring by. So that might be the event rate or the event count. Um, Basically, that's the decision uh, we were making there with count versus rate. So if we were flying, if we wanted to see, you know, which individual airport has had the most unstable approaches, that's when we'd use something like count. But if we wanted to see what our top event is, that, that would be when we'd use things like rate. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the last one here is that the, uh, the KPVs are generated automatically and not validated. So is it possible to identify the flights associated with the KPV data point on a chart? And is it possible to remove them if I deem them to be invalid? Okay, so um, 
key point values that are extremely invalid um, are already wiped out by the system. So the system doesn't just automatically validate its own key point values. If it, if it calculates one and it's outside of selected bounds, so you know, if it calculates that the airspeed at touchdown was a thousand knots, it will wipe that out already. So you won't see that on your chart. Um, you'll also find that any key point values that, most key point values that are interesting, um, if they're extremely in one direction, so they're extremely low, extremely high, will have triggered a level three event. And that will be, um, that event will be um, invalidated by an analyst here. So we've got a team of flight data analysts, I'm one of them. Um, when events are, are triggered by the system, uh, we check that A, that they're valid, so that they did happen and it's not just a data problem or an algorithm problem. And then we add extra information, so in terms of a comment, um, if you're joining for the analysis investigation uh, webinar tomorrow morning, you'll see an example of that. And we'll do a little live demo of what we do um, when we're checking an event. But uh, yeah, so most of what you're going to see in here um, will be broadly valid. Yeah. And yes, you can, um, there is a way to link back, you know, a particular, so if you see in a flight that has um, a gas temperature of 900 degrees at the start, you can do a particular flight search. So in the same way that I just did a search for unstable approaches, I could actually tell the system, you know, show me every single flight where the value of gas temperature at start was more than 900, for example. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Um, what have we got here? Our regulator has set the high, medium and low values and the events that need to be checked. So in such a case, how would you configure events? Okay, so if you're a member of the IATA Flight Data Exchange Program, um, that's analysis specification. So the set of events and the thresholds that that program will monitor for you, um, it's very much set, you won't be changing those. Um, that's so you can compare yourself to other operators of the same type. Now, if you wanted to set your, your thresholds in the Flight Data Connect part of the service, um, not a problem. Let us know what limits um, or what your regulator tells you to monitor, and we can set you up um, with specifically what they want you to monitor. So if they say, you, know, you have to tell us if you have a landing more than 2G, not a problem. We'll set a threshold at 2G. So you can then run a statistics report later on um, to say, ah, oh, yes, this is the reports we have to, uh, the events we have to report. I should, I've actually completely forgotten to mention the bookmarking feature. So up in the top right here, if I find a chart that I'm particularly interested in, so this, let's say it's this one, I can, I've just got to move the zoom thing down. I can bookmark this. So if I say, you know, uh, call that flare, call it, call, it, call it flare, and I'll bookmark that. When I log into the system, um, I will be greeted with this page here. Now, I'll just F5 that quickly. So this lead shows us um, any events that are awaiting our attention, so that have been checked by the analysts and have their comments there. But you'll also see this quick statistics tab up here. So all I've got to do is click here. And on the left hand side, we'll see, think of this as quick stats. So I've just made a flare bookmark. So all I've got to do is click on that, and that chart generates there. So if you've grouped um, if you have certain events that your uh, that your regulator wants to monitor, let us know, or you, you can do it yourself. We'll teach you how. Um, you can set yourself up a little chart so that when you log into the system and you have to prepare a report for your operator uh, for your regulator, just click, uh, open up your quick chart, just expand it a little bit, and then you can just download that um, as an image, very quick, and it will just pop up as a little image. And if you need to, you can export that um, in any way you want or you can amend your chart uh, in the statistics platform down there. So yes, um, yeah, if, you're, if your regulator tells you to look for certain things, um, do what they say, and uh, we can help you out. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one, can we invalidate an event, or is it only done by you, uh, Amos? Uh, you can invalidate the event, yes. So there is an operator invalid feature available. So when I was looking at particular events, um, I don't have, on this account, I haven't put that permission there, um, but I would see, we'll just pick any random event that pops up. We'll have ZZ, it would have Ziggy. Um, so yeah, I, at the moment I will see that this event is valid and it's open, but if I, if I had assigned the relevant permission to this user, I would see an extra button next to it that says operator invalid. So if I was triggering, you know, a heading variation event while on 
the Canazi approach into New York and to JFK, you're going to have a heading variation there because by definition, you will have a heading variation. I could operate it and validate that. Or if you, if you find yourself flying a particular route very often, uh, you can patch on a particular event. So I could say, actually, don't trigger this event if landing into a certain airport um, or use a different threshold for a, different, for a certain airport. So yes, in short, you can um, have the invalidate option. Thank you. And uh, you'll need your crystal ball for this one, I think. How do you see the future of safety aviation statistics regarding quantum computation and algorithm development? Right. Um, personally, it might seem a bit short-sighted, but I don't anticipate you know, quantum computing impacting like statistics too much. Um, it will add computing power, no doubt. Um, but yeah, nothing miraculous probably. Really what I think is gonna be one of the major turning points in um, flight safety statistics in the coming years will be um, artificial intelligence and machine applying machine learning to this. So being able to spot, um, I call it strangeness, so being able to spot when um, a certain parameter that might be the elevator on a particular aircraft isn't responding to um, inputs similarly to how it previously was or anything like that. So yeah, um, yeah, I would say the only real advantage of quantum stuff would be um, to do with the increased power that it could give uh, machine learning. Okay, thanks. Um, can, uh, can we have different event thresholds configured for different airfields? Yes. Short answer, yes. Um, you can have it for different runways, different airports, different aircraft. Um, yeah, basically. Whatever you need us to do, um, just let us know and we can set that up. And someone's asking if they can access the presentation, and yes, they can. We will send a link to the recording uh, at some point uh, in the near future. So that's the last of the questions, Andy. Thank you. Thank you very much for a great presentation, and thanks everyone for attending. We'll wrap it up there and have a nice evening. And I guess we'll see you, or not see you, but we'll. We'll, uh, we'll be here with you tomorrow. Thanks.